At first, life in this new nation under the law of Moses went reasonably well. They generally adhered to the law, and when they made mistakes they humbly went to God with their sacrifice to be ceremonially cleansed. Because they were trying to obey the law, their country experienced the blessings of prosperity, health and safety that had been promised within the covenant, and an early pinnacle was reached under the righteous rulership of King David. Unfortunately, things were never quite that good again. From the glorious heights of David's reign, they began turning away from God to follow idols and inevitably plunged into a decline. Without a reference point for their moral compass, moral entropy soon followed and evil began to spread throughout the land. Though God was patient with them and gave them warnings ahead of time to return to him, their behaviour didn't improve and the curses of the covenant began to come into play. Instead of prosperity, health and safety, Israel began experiencing poverty, sickness and terror. Foreign nations invaded and destroyed their city walls, scattering the people from their homes. Sickness and disease ravaged the land and depression and despair gripped the hearts of the people. Eventually, they ended up in bondage. When we consider that God had told them up front that obedience would lead to blessing and disobedience would lead to curses for their nation, it seems like insanity that they would choose to be disobedient anyway. Who would deliberately choose curses over blessing? But if you'll remember from Tyler's graph, this is what always happens. God blesses the people with abundance, the people begin to think they achieve the blessing by their own efforts and that they don't need God anymore, they turn away from him towards selfishness and the whole thing starts to fall apart. Poverty, sickness and terror and eventually bondage inevitably follows. Israel's experience highlights this phenomenon perfectly and reveals the moral entropy of the human heart. It naturally leans away from God towards selfishness and self-interest, even when we know things will end badly by our actions. Jeremiah wrote, The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You see, we have an innate sickness in the core of our being that means we sometimes don't even understand our own behaviour. Who can understand why a married man gives up his wife and family for one selfish night of adultery? Often he doesn't even understand it himself. Paul explains this frustrating phenomenon when he says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. We have a disease of sin living within us that inclines us towards selfishness and moral entropy. Even when we know the difference between right and wrong and we desperately want to do the right thing all the time, we find we can't. We have a terminal sickness in our hearts. This terminal sickness means that the law of Moses was, in truth, always going to be abandoned. It was completely inevitable that Israel would turn away from it and God towards self-interest. And this is the problem with any law. While it can show people the difference between good and evil, it has no power to stop people from loving evil. In other words, the law can reveal to people what a midday sky looks like, but it can't stop them from preferring to live in darkness. It can show them what a good apple looks like, but it can't stop them from loving their own rottenness. It can show them what sin is, but it can't stop them from loving their sin. In the same way that knowing greasy hamburgers are bad for us doesn't stop us loving greasy hamburgers, and knowing Brussels sprouts are good for us doesn't make us love Brussels sprouts. In other words, law does not impart righteousness. We don't automatically love good and hate evil, even when we know the difference. What really needs to be fixed is the heart of a person, the part that chooses. Something has to change in the core of an individual so that they not only know the difference between right and wrong, but they want to choose to do the right thing. The people of Israel had been told what absolute goodness was through the law of Moses. They had no excuse on that front, but they still had no inclination in their hearts to go after it because they had this heart sickness that inevitably leads to selfish moral entropy. Deep down, they didn't crave God or his righteousness. God describes their problem saying, your injury is incurable, a terrible wound. There is no one to plead your cause or to bind up your injury. No medicine can heal you. They were in a bit of a hopeless situation. Without internal renovation, without new hearts, they were doomed to eternally keep breaking God's laws, becoming slaves to self in the process, and ultimately bringing themselves and their country to ruin, bondage and death. Life under the law of Moses was not going well. 
Thankfully, in the midst of this hopelessness, while Israel was at its lowest ebb and the nation lay in ruins because of the sin of the people, God started to make some very exciting promises. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. God was promising a cure for the heart sickness. He was promising that a time would come when they would not only know what absolute good was, but that they'd crave it. He would do this by putting his own spirit inside his people and transforming their hearts. With promises of internal renovation, suddenly there was hope for the people of Israel and ultimately the whole of mankind. Because remember, when you put people right internally, everything else takes care of itself. There's a ripple effect that starts from the centre and gradually works its way outward. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Instead of writing his laws on external parchment and stone as he had done at Sinai, he was instead going to write his instructions deep within the hearts of his people and heal them internally. He goes further in explaining how this would happen, saying, The day will come when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I have promised them. In those days and at that time I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Remember that vital phrase. God was promising that things would one day radically change. A Messiah was on his way. A Messiah who would come through the lineage of King David, introducing a brand new covenant, a new relationship between men and God, and a new dispensation of time. A time when God would somehow perform the heart renovation that the people so desperately needed and create a way to have his spirit implanted within them. This spirit would cause their calloused and unresponsive hearts to long for God. Most intriguingly of all, the Messiah would create a way for them to claim righteousness through him. This was exciting stuff. Suddenly there was hope. The Messiah, as we now know today, was Jesus Christ, and for hundreds of years prior to his birth, the people of Israel waited for him, knowing that he was their only hope of salvation from bondage, sin and death.